All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started now. I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Krzyzewski from ACI. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Frank Krzyzewski with the American Cleaning Institute, where I am Senior Director for Human Health and Safety. I would like to welcome you all to this third session within our Advancing the Science webinar series on chemical-induced asthma. Today, we welcome Dr. Judy Lekind, who will be presenting our webinar that is focused on the topic of environmental exposures and asthma. The American Cleaning Institute is glad to be hosting this webinar series and also to be working in collaboration with the Toxicology Excellence for Risk Assessment Center at the University of Cincinnati. This group is assisting us in this project's development and implementation. And we are also pleased that this webinar has received the endorsements of the Society for Toxicology and the Society for Risk Analysis. The American Cleaning Institute, or ACI, is a trade association based in Washington, D.C. ACI is the home of the U.S. cleaning products industry, and it represents the $30 billion U.S. cleaning products market. ACI members include the formulators of soaps, detergents, and general cleaning products as used in household, commercial, industrial, and institutional settings. Our members also include companies that supply ingredients and finished packaging for these products, as well as oleochemical producers. ACI's interest in sponsoring this webinar series is to advance our understanding of the science which underlies the relationships between chemicals and asthma, especially with respect to cleaning products and to consumer products in general. I would like to now hand the program over to the associates of the University of Cincinnati Terrace Center, who will be moderating today's webinar. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, please remember if you have any technical difficulties during the process of this webinar to contact the number here on your screen. This information is also provided in your registration emails. So um, there's this is the cell phone number to contact if you're having any difficulty uh, logging in or hearing um, any portion of the webinar series. If you have any questions, we do welcome questions, but we will save them for the end. You can submit questions through the question function in the GoToWebinar toolbar. It's located towards the bottom of the toolbar. At the end, we will summarize key questions uh, with as much time as is allowed in, or allotted. Um, if we have any questions that we are not able to get to within our hour, we will uh, send them to Dr. Judy Lekind afterwards, and she has graciously agreed to answer any questions uh, that have not been addressed during this webinar series. So we will still seek to get to any of your questions, even if they haven't been addressed during this webinar. If you need assistance with question submission, please send a chat to Patricia Nance. So the purpose of this webinar series is that we are seeking to gain a comprehensive understanding of the current state of science and data gaps in asthma risk assessment knowledge, and specifically in asthma diagnosis and research. We can use this information to develop risk assessment approaches, specifically hazard characterization approaches, to address issues and future data needs in protecting against harmful exposures and chemical asthma risks. This is part three of a multi-part series. I hope you all have been able to join us for the previous uh, webinars uh, with Dr. Jonathan Bernstein and Dr. David Basketer. Today, Judy Lekind, Dr. Judy Lekind is presenting for us the future webinars are uh, Dr. Scott Dotson from NIOSH. He will be discussing um, setting exposure limits for chemical allergens. And following that in October is Dr. Andrew Mayer with the University of Cincinnati Terra Center. And he's going to be discussing asthma-specific hazard characterization approaches. I hope that you are all interested and wanting to participate in these future webinars as well. And with that, I'd like to pass over the presentation to Dr. Judy Lekind. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, introductory information. And good morning, everybody. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about cleaning, environmental exposures, and respiratory health effects. And the focus is going to be on assessing exposures to environmental chemicals. And while this webinar series addresses cleaning products and respiratory health, the approaches, issues, and challenges related to assessing Muted. exposures apply not only to chemicals in cleaning products and respiratory health, but other chemical exposure health outcome associations as well. So I hit the down arrow and unmuted. It moved. All right. Can you try again for me, Judy? It should work now. 
I know there can be a lag, but it's not moving yet. Okay, I just moved it, but um, that might have fixed the problem. If it doesn't after this slide, let me know. Okay. So just as an aside, for many of the slides that you'll be seeing, Muted. the bottom corner of the slides, I'll provide you with either a citation or a URL. And there's something to do, um, there's a technical issue with GoToWebinar that's resulted sometimes in the bottom part of that slide being cut off. And so don't worry about that for today because you'll have access to these slides later on and you'll be able to get the URLs and citations then. Okay, so there are three learning objectives for this webinar. The first is to be able to describe methods for estimating environmental exposures for household or indoor air, although, uh, as I just mentioned, the concepts in this webinar are broadly applicable and include other exposure pathways as well. The second is to be able to describe challenges and limitations with these methods, particularly when it comes to evaluating causal relationships between exposures and health effects. And the third is to learn about complexities related to trying to contrast risks and benefits using an example of a cleaning-related activity. Okay, so it's not moving. Should I just say next? Unmuted. Yes, please. Okay, so next slide, please. So the outline for the webinar is as follows. I'll begin with some brief introductory material and Muted. a little bit about the who, what, where, when, why of exposure assessment. And I'll follow this with a description of three approaches for assessing exposures and then go into some detail about how we evaluate strengths and weaknesses in these approaches. And then lastly, I'm going to describe a case study that hopefully will get us thinking about balancing risks and benefits. And this case study is going to be on swimming pool water disinfection. Next slide, please. Now, as a reminder, the past couple of webinars provided us with a lot of information about asthma in terms of both clinical aspects as well as toxicological considerations. And we also learned about challenges associated with understanding the etiology of asthma, and in particular, the struggles with studying links between exposures to chemicals and cleaning products and the initiation or exacerbation of asthma. And the quote on this slide from Mayer all kind of captures this problem. They wrote that we see that the complex mixture of biological mechanisms makes the prediction and characterization of causal relationships between exposure and asthma very challenging. Next slide, please. So we know that in terms of human biology, the issue is complex and it requires you know, a lot more study. But what about exposure? In this webinar, we're going to shift gears and we're going to focus on the exposure part of the equation. So next slide, please. So let's begin with the definition. I'm sorry, it was really the bottom of the previous slide. So let's begin with the definition of exposure science. So really what we're talking about here is the study of an organism's contact with chemical, physical, or biological agents occurring in their environments. Next. So why are exposure assessments so important? Why is it that we need to focus on exposure? A critical reason is that we use our understanding of the relationship between chemical exposures and health outcomes to set health protective limits. And two approaches that are used for getting at these links between exposure and health outcome are epidemiological studies and risk assessment. And epi studies can be used to actually to support the risk assessment process. So in epi research, we explore the relationship between exposure to chemicals and association with adverse health outcomes. In risk assessment, we use information from epi studies as well as toxicological research and other types of studies to try to estimate the likelihood of an adverse health outcome in a population. And both of these can focus on chemicals and cleaning products and respiratory health or, again, other exposure health outcome um, pairs. But both epi studies and risk assessment require robust assessments of exposure. So let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about each of these. Next. So as shown here, epidemiology is the study and analysis of patterns, causes, and effects of health and disease conditions in a defined population. So if you look at the figure on the slide, you can see, for example, that you might have two groups of people. One group that's shown here on the red target has been exposed to a chemical, and the others haven't been exposed. So we might follow these two groups of people over time to figure out whether the exposed people are at greater risk of a specific health outcome compared to the non-exposed part of the population. And our ability to do this kind of evaluation and to do it well requires a good estimate of exposure. Next, please. The definition of risk assessment is shown on this slide. 
So human health risk assessment is the process used to estimate the nature and the probability of adverse health effects in humans who may be exposed to chemicals and contaminated environmental media now or in the future. And the four-step risk assessment paradigm is shown on this slide, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, but for those who aren't, let me just spend a minute talking about this. So on the top left box in this diagram, you can see hazard identification. This is a step in which we seek to understand what health outcomes might be caused by a chemical. So what's the critical target organ that we're concerned about? And this is followed by the box on the right, dose response assessment. So once we know that from the hazard ID step, which health outcome we're interested in, we need to quantify the relationship between exposure and outcome, and also the shape of the dose response curve. So these two steps or boxes on the top complete the toxicity part of the risk assessment, and this is what we heard a lot about in the last two webinars. The box at the bottom of the diagram represents the exposure assessment step. And here we're going to collect information on how much of the chemical people are exposed to, how long they're exposed, the frequency of exposure, and so on. And then we combine the information in these three boxes on the left to derive an estimate of the likelihood or the probability of an adverse outcome occurring in that exposed population. And that's the risk characterization step, and you can see that on the right part of the diagram. And our confidence in the characterization of that risk is directly related to the confidence in our exposure assessment. Next. Now let's move on to what it is that we need to measure. In exposure assessment, we're interested in understanding which chemicals and how much of these chemicals cross absorption barriers. So absorption barriers are any of the exchange barriers in the body that are going to allow chemicals to cross from the environment into a human. This is going to include skin, lung tissue, and the gastrointestinal tract wall. Next. And there are two main approaches for understanding and evaluating what's crossing an absorption boundary. One of these is the aggregate exposure assessment approach. And in this case, we're looking at exposure to a single chemical, but we're going to take into account all the pathways and the routes. And by route, I'm talking about ingestion, inhalation, and, and the dermal routes of exposure. In the second approach, shown on the right, we examine cumulative exposure. And in this case, we want to evaluate combined chemical exposures and combined exposure routes. So in the situation on the left, we think about exposure one chemical at a time. And on the right, we try to estimate exposure levels to mixtures of chemicals. Next. So in trying to figure out what crosses the various boundaries, we have different approaches for how to organize our thinking, and that's pretty useful. But what is it exactly we're trying to assess? So in thinking about cleaning products, we can look at some examples of chemicals. And some of these we saw in the previous presentations in this webinar series. So this list that you can see here comes from a paper by Quirson Barranco on cleaning agents and asthma. And these are some chemicals in cleaning products that have been linked to work-related respiratory symptoms. And the list includes both sensitizers and irritants. And it's, I guess, a moderately long list, but it likely doesn't even come close to representing the world of chemicals in cleaning products in both workplace and the home environment. Next. But even if we assumed that the chemicals in that list did encompass the world of cleaning product chemicals that humans you know, could be exposed to, the effort required for estimating exposures to these chemicals is still really complicated. And Mayer et al. summarized this problem as well, and that's shown on this slide. So we have to not only think about a single chemical from a single product, but possibly a single product that has multiple chemicals in it, or a single chemical that's in multiple different products, or, of course, multiple chemicals from multiple products. So things are already becoming pretty difficult here, as we have different pathways of exposure, different routes of exposure, and multiple potential combinations of chemicals associated with cleaning activities. Next. A further pro uh, problem that was highlighted by, by uh, Van den Plas et al. is that there's actually very little available information on specific chemicals in cleaning products, especially when you look at studies of asthma. The studies that we do have are mostly focused on irritants like bleach and ammonia, and a few other chemicals have been described in case reports. And these are the kinds of studies where you have an individual going to a doctor with specific symptoms and where the person's exposure might be linked to certain chemicals. But overall, I think it's fair to say that the literature is quite sparse. Next. So now let's move to the who part of the discussion. 
we can't use one generic human to represent all human exposures. And this slide just shows one example of why that is. So, for example, we might be interested in occupational exposures to cleaning products. In this case, we have to consider that workers may use protective equipment, and that could reduce the amount of a chemical crossing and absorption boundary. Workers might also be exposed regularly, so for 40 hours a week over the course of years. And then, you know, we might expect workers in this country to be uh, primarily be adults, and they're going to have breathing rates and skin surface areas that are specific to adults. In contrast, we might be interested in personal exposures. So this could involve consideration of adults, but also children and infants. And adults and children are going to have very different types of exposures. Their skin surface areas are different. Their breathing rates are different. And also their behaviors are different. We expect kids to spend more time in close contact with floors and also to spend more time with fingers in their mouths compared to adults. Those are just you know, two examples. So the who aspect of exposure assessment is important, and it also introduces many additional complexities to the exposure assessment. Next. We also need to consider when in exposure assessment. Are people exposed just one time or daily or weekly? Are the exposures repeated or are they continuous? So for example, in that occupational setting that I mentioned before, you could imagine a situation where a person is exposed to a chemical eight hours a day in contrast with a person who, say, dusts their home and who might be exposed once a week for a brief amount of time. What about the how we're exposed? Cleaners come in all different shapes and sizes, and the way that cleaners are used is going to, at least in part, determine the extent and duration of exposure. So, you know, if you use a wipe, that's going to produce a different kind of exposure compared to if you were using a spray, and that's going to be different from a wax and so on. And finally, we're going to have to consider how people are exposed, and I've already alluded to this, but just to sum it up, we can have one or a combination of routes of exposures, and each one is going to need to be evaluated separately. Next. So I hope this last part of the webinar gave you a sense of sources of complications when it comes to estimating exposures to cleaning product chemicals. So now let's move on to the third part of the webinar, and that's approaches to assessing exposure. Next. The three main approaches for estimating or measuring exposures have been described by the US EPA. The first is to directly measure chemicals at the point of contact. The second is to indirectly estimate exposure. And the third is to the use of exposure reconstruction with, uh, with biomonitoring. And so what I'd like to do in the next several slides is give you some details about each of these approaches and then focus on strengths and weaknesses for each. Next. With direct measurements, we're going to evaluate exposures as they occur by using direct methods to measure the chemical concentration at the interface between the person and the environment. And we can do this as a function of time. So we end up with an exposure profile. So I'd like to show you an example in the next slide. So in this, in this paper, Bello et al. sought to quantitatively assess airborne exposure to chemicals during common cleaning tasks. And the researchers were trying to understand variability in exposure, and they also wanted to look at short-term or peak exposures. So they simulated various tasks that included cleaning a sink, a mirror, and a toilet bowl, and they did this either in a large ventilated bathroom or a small unventilated bathroom, and they had study participants using different cleaners for about 10 minutes. And during that time, and after cessation of cleaning activities, the researchers measured volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, using a direct reading instrument. And they also specifically looked at ammonia with a sensor that they had embedded in that instrument. And they tried to keep the instrument right at the breathing height of the person doing the activity. So this was a really, a really um, carefully conducted study. And so let's look at some results. And that's going to be on the next slide. So there's a lot of information in this slide. So let me get you oriented. The three plots show concentration data on the y-axis. So that's total VOCs on the y-axis. The x-axis shows time from the start of cleaning through the end of the cleaning task, and that's at about 10 minutes, and you can see that with the orange vertical lines on each of those graphics. But they kept following people out for another 20 minutes after they stopped cleaning. And I've labeled each diagram by task so you can see the results for the sink and the mirror and the toilet bowl. And the pink curve on each of these is the small unventilated bathroom, and the blue is the large ventilated bathroom. So that's basically what's shown here. The key result that I'd like you to notice is that the maximum exposure occurs around 10 minutes into the activity, 
but even after cessation of that activity, it takes about another 20 minutes for the air concentrations of these cleaning chemicals to go back to background. So the point here is that if you were to simply measure the concentrations of the cleaning product chemicals at the beginning of the person's cleaning episode, you'd miss that peak exposure. Alternatively, if you were to only measure the peak, you might not understand how quickly the drop-off in air concentrations occur, and you'd likely incorrectly estimate that person's overall exposure. So this approach of using direct measurements and examining exposure profiles over time is quite important in terms of really being able to correctly estimate a person's overall exposure. Now, the other key result I'd like you to notice is that the size of the room area and ventilation obviously has a large impact on exposure as well. And these kinds of factors need to be considered when we're doing cleaning chemical studies. OK, next. So the next approach is indirect estimation. And this is defined by EPA as quantifying exposure by measuring or estimating the amount of chemical contacted and the frequency and duration of contact. And we link these together to obtain an overall estimate of exposure or dose. Next. So for example, you on, so I'll just give it a second. Next slide, please. So here you might have measurements of a particular chemical being emitted from, you see that room with the fireplace. So you might have chemicals being emitted while the fire is burning. And you could combine that concentration data with information on how long a person might sit in that room while the fire is burning. And that information you might get, say, from questionnaire data. Alternatively, you might have gas seeping through the foundation of the house from the subsurface beneath the house. And you may not have any actual measurements in the house, but only measurements in the subsurface. And in this situation, you could use a model to estimate how much of the gas is seeping from the subsurface through the foundation and into the basement. And you could then combine that information with estimates of how much time a person might spend in that basement environment. So you can see here the difference between indirect estimates and direct measurements. In this case, we're not following an individual and measuring their specific exposure profile over time. We're getting concentration data either from measurements or models and combining those with what we understand about human activity to estimate chemical exposure. So how do we do that? Next slide. How do we combine all of this information? Well, there's guidance on this. And for example, EPA has guidance from its Superfund program. So let's say you wanted to be able to estimate the amount of inhalation exposure associated with a cleaning chemical and a cleaning product. You might use an equation that looks something like what you see on this slide. You've got the exposure concentration on the left. And on the right-hand side of the, of the equation, you, you have uh, various kinds of information that you would need to obtain. So for example, the amount of the chemical in air, the amount of time a person is exposed, say hours per day, or the frequency of exposure, say days per year, and the duration uh, in years. And if we look at the next slide, this is an example of a similar kind of algorithm, but this is for dermal exposure. So as you can see, just glancing at this, I don't expect you to dive into this equation. But if you were interested in understanding how much of a chemical would cross the skin, the equation does get a little more complicated. So this one, this equation that you're looking at, it would allow you to calculate the amount of chemical dermally absorbed when that chemical is in a, in a water solution. And there's obviously a lot here that we need to know. We're going to need to know the fraction of the chemical that can get across the skin the duration of exposure, the concentration of the chemical in water, and so on. And we would combine all this information in order to get at the amount of the chemical that crosses the skin surface and gets into the body. In terms of where we can find the data that we need to use this equation, there's documentation that's been developed by EPA with tables and lots of data. And you'll be able to see the citation on this slide. And you can use this guidance document to find chemical-specific information that you would need to conduct this kind of assessment. OK, next slide. Now, what about the people that we're interested in? Different people are going to have different behaviors, different amounts of time spent cleaning, different amounts of time spent, for example, as I mentioned before, with one's hand in one's mouth, it's going to you know, transfer chemicals into the um, gastrointestinal system, different amounts of skin surface areas, and so on. Unfortunately, EPA has made obtaining this information really easy. It's assembled 
all the available data in the literature on all these different types of behaviors and activities, as well as adult and child specific physiological information into a document called the Exposure Factors Handbook, and that's what you're looking at here. You can actually find this handbook online, and the URL is, is there as well, and you'll be able to, to get this later. And this is really a fantastic source of exposure information. Next slide. Just to give you an example, um, this next slide has, there it is, a table just directly taken from the handbook, and this shows data on frequency of use for household solvent products. So you can kind of get a sense of just how data rich this document is. Next slide. Now, if you're specifically interested in obtaining data for kids, EPA also made available a child specific exposure factors handbook. And again, I've given you the URL for this, and you can get to this uh, later on. Next slide. So here, I just wanted to show you some examples related to information in the Exposure Factors Handbook on consumer products. So as an example, if you look at the third row down in this table, you can see there's information on household cleaning and maintenance products. And there's information for both genders, and you can get data on things like exposure time and hours for performing a given task per year and frequency of use per year. And the nice thing about these kinds of tables is they also tell you where in the handbook you can go to find the actual data. Okay, next. The examples that I just showed you in the previous slide are pretty simple and straightforward equations, and they can be used to estimate exposures to cleaning chemicals and other chemicals as well. But there are also more complex and sophisticated models that can be used to estimate exposures. For example, there's a model that was developed by the Netherlands National Institute for Public Health and the Environment it's called CONSEXPO. This is the consumer exposure and uptake model. It covers a wide range of consumer products. It can be used to estimate exposures under various scenarios. And again, I've given you the URL for the website, and this is kind of nice because it links you directly to the model, and the model is freely available. So you could, you could download and use this model. Okay, next. So, so far we've talked about two of the three approaches that I mentioned earlier, direct measurements, and that gives us information on exposure profiles over time, and indirect estimates in which we can use different algorithms to help us estimate exposures under different scenarios. The third approach for estimating exposures is biomonitoring. Now in this approach, we're going to use internal body measurements rather than external environmental measurements to estimate dose. So you might get these internal measures, for example, from analysis of urine or blood or exhaled breath and so on. And with biomonitoring, there are a number of advantages and limitations. And looking at the left-hand side for a minute, you can see that because we're measuring the chemical concentration in a person's body, we're measuring aggregate and cumulative exposures. So you might recall that I mentioned early in this webinar that aggregate exposure is where we focus on one chemical and all pathways of exposure, and cumulative exposure, we're looking at different chemicals of interest and in all pathways. So we get all of this from biomonitoring. In this way, the nice thing is we don't have to worry that we're missing an important route of exposure because everything that got into the person, you know, we're going to measure. The second advantage is that we're getting an understanding of both uptake and accumulation. So some chemicals we're exposed to, they get in the body, and they're excreted from the body really quickly, sometimes in a matter of hours. But other chemicals enter the body and are stored in the body for months or even you know, years. So when we measure the chemical using biomonitoring, we're getting an understanding of not only uptake, but also accumulation. And finally, in some instances, although relatively few, we might be able to correlate that internal dose that we're measuring with an observed health effect. OK, so what about limitations? Well, it's definitely an advantage that we can get information on aggregate and cumulative exposures. It's also the case that because we're measuring what's already in the body, we won't get information on specific sources or routes of exposure. And this really can be problematic. So for example, what if we have multiple sources of exposure to cleaning chemicals, and we want to know which one is the greatest source of exposure, because that's the one we want to limit? Biomonitoring isn't going to help us here. Now, a second limitation is that biomonitoring clearly requires permission for collection of samples, right? You can't go and get a blood sample without, you know, a lot of permission. So it adds a lot of administrative effort to your study compared to, say, measuring chemicals in air samples. And the third limitation is that it actually can be quite difficult to interpret potential health risks using biomonitoring data. 
So traditionally in risk assessment, we're used to interpreting exposure information by comparing doses and units of say milligram, kilogram day to a toxic potency value that's in the same units. But biomonitoring doesn't give us daily dose information, and we're not nearly as far along in terms of being able to use internal measurements to directly understand health outcomes. And finally, as you can see on this slide, biomonitoring can be costly, although I will say that environmental monitoring is also costly. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here you can see an example of a study that actually used air monitoring, monitoring excuse me, in combination with biomonitoring. And what these researchers were doing was exploring infant exposures to certain chemicals. And as an aside, I'll just mention that these are chemicals that are found in cleaning products, but also in other materials and, and in foods. And the researchers looked at 45 daycare centers, and they collected infant urine samples after those infants spent a full day at the daycare center. And they also conducted short-term air monitoring at the centers. Now, they found what was a weak association between the levels of some of the metabolites they measured in infant urine samples with the indoor air levels. And so this kind of raised questions about whether there might be other sources of these chemicals to the infants, like, say, diet or other personal products. And it also raised questions about whether or not the air sampling was representative of infant exposures. So this is kind of a nice, a nice study where they use two different methods. And um, I will say that there's not a lot of literature uh, like this on cleaning products. So um, this is, it was one of uh, the only examples that I found. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so let's move on to the strengths and weaknesses with these different approaches. So for direct measurements, a question that we have to ask is whether the concentration data that we're measuring during the activity is generalizable. So for example, we might have a study where we put personal monitors on 10 people and we have them conduct a cleaning activity. We measure the level of that chemical in their monitors <clears throat> over the duration of the cleaning activity, and we collect data. We then need to ask things like, are those 10 people representative of a wider population? And are the data we collected useful for other populations, even those performing the same activity? I mean, this issue of generalizability is a really common problem when we have small population sizes or a limited number of measurements. Okay, if you could hit the down arrow. So what about approaches using indirect estimates? In this case, we might estimate exposures for different kinds of populations and chemicals, but we need to ask the following kinds of questions. What are the uncertainties with our estimates? Are we doing a good job of understanding fate and transport of chemicals of interest? What about the exposure factors data we may have gotten from the exposure factors handbook? Are they high quality data? Are they broadly applicable to the population that we're interested in? I mean, generally speaking, and I know you've heard this before, but the output that we get from our different models, whether, whether we're using a simple algorithm or whether we're using a complex software-based model, the model outputs are only going to be as good as the data that go into the model. Next. Now, the Exposure Factors Handbook does include information on the level of confidence for recommended data. And this is a really good starting point. So this slide just shows you an example as part of a table describing EPA's confidence in recommendations for long and short-term inhalation rates. And in general, we're going to need to make judgments about data quality, and we're going to have to be transparent about those judgments when we develop exposure estimates. Next. Now I'm going to spend a little more time on strengths and weaknesses of biomonitoring because this has become uh, a really popular and commonly used approach to exposure assessment, particularly in the last decade. So in a workshop that we held a couple of years ago, a group of researchers discussed systematic approaches to evaluating the quality of biomonitoring data, particularly for its use in epi research. And the outcome of that workshop was an evaluative instrument, and I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. But first on this slide, you can see several of the factors that need to be assessed when determining whether biomonitoring data provides robust exposure information. And I don't have time to talk about all of these in this webinar, and I would refer you to the citation in the lower corner of the slide for more information. But for now, for this webinar, I just want to highlight a couple of examples. Okay, if you could hit the down arrow. So an important and unfortunately often overlooked factor is whether the study demonstrates that exposure preceded the onset of the health outcome. Now, what's really the problem here? The problem is that biomonitoring is frequently conducted after the onset of the health outcome. 
In addition, it's often the case that only one sample is collected. So we have exposure information for one point in time. In other words, we have a snapshot of exposure, and that's it. So we don't know whether biomonitoring data reflect exposures prior to the time of the onset of the health outcome, for example, asthma, and whether those exposures um, can cause the health outcome. So why is that? Well, if we knew that the chemical, uh, excuse me, if we knew that the exposure to a chemical was constant over a long period of time, then that might work. You could take one sample and have some confidence that that exposure level existed before the health on the onset of the health outcome. But for many of the chemicals that are in cleaning products, there's large temporal variability in exposure. So a snapshot of your exposure today doesn't necessarily tell me anything about what you were exposed to last week or last year or maybe a few years ago when the health outcome of interest began to develop. So what I'd like to do is just show you a few examples that I think will drive this home. Next. So when discussing temporal variability, we're asking the following question. Can one sample be used to understand longer term exposures? In order to answer this in the affirmative, we have to have confidence that variability in exposure is minimal. Now in the example of cleaning products and asthma, if we were to conduct a study with a cohort with pre-existing asthma, we need to be confident that any exposure measurement is reflective of that cohort's exposure before the onset of asthma. So let me show you some examples. We go to the next slide. And I'd just like to mention that the following several slides are courtesy of Dr. Ben Blunt at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the first study I'll briefly be describing is the tap water exposure study. And you can see the collaborators here. Next. In this study, the researchers were interested in understanding human exposure to a chemical that's a byproduct of drinking water disinfection, and that's called chloroform. Now, we're exposed to chloroform when we shower, when we run the dishwasher, when we drink water, and so on. And levels of chloroform in this study were measured in the blood of 49 volunteers before and after they showered. So the bars in blue are pre-shower measurements, and the red are post-shower. And what we see here is that clearly after shower concentrations of chloroform in the blood are much higher than before showering. So the take home here is that understanding when the blood samples were taken relative to the time of showering is extremely important for interpreting these biomonitoring exposure data. And the second take home is that there's obviously a lot of time dependent variability in the biomonitoring data. So one measurement is not going to provide information on long term exposures. Next. Another water disinfection byproduct is called bromodichloromethane. And in a similar study, subjects were exposed to water either by putting their arms in tap water for an hour or by drinking 250 mils of tap water. And then there were a series of blood samples that were collected from these individuals. Next. And here are the biomonitoring study results. So in this graphic, we're looking on the y-axis at the concentration of bromodichloromethane in blood in the volunteers. And on the x-axis, we're looking at the time after exposure. And the green line shows the concentrations in blood after dermal exposure, and the blue line is after oral exposure. So the first message here is that, again, there's obviously a lot of temporal variability in exposure. Secondly, it's important to notice that post-dermal exposure, so that um, green line, we see a slow increase. And that's likely related to slower absorption across the skin barrier compared to oral exposure. So the levels we measure are going to be exposure route dependent. And the take home again is that no single measurement is going to capture the complexity of exposures related to these different exposure routes. So these examples again should give you a sense of the complexity of variability in exposure and the limitations with using one measurement of exposure to represent longer term exposures. Next. Okay, so now I'd like to give you an example of a potential limitation related to contamination and biomonitoring. Now, it kind of seems like it should go without saying that avoidance of sample contamination is critical to obtaining good exposure data. But I think what you'll find as you go into the literature that many studies don't include steps necessary to avoid sample contamination. And sometimes that contamination can come from really unexpected places. Next. So the example I'm going to share with you comes from a study that several of us conducted. And this was looking at methodological issues related to measurements of volatile organic compounds in human milk. And we were looking at two methods for obtaining milk samples. We used manual expression and the use of a breast pump. And with manual expression, we were actually kind of worried about the loss of VOCs during milk collection. 
but also contamination of those samples from VOCs that happen to be in the air in the room. So we were worried about chemicals leaving the sample and chemicals getting into the sample. And both of those problems would prevent us from measuring what was actually in the mother. For the samples obtained where we used a breast pump, we were worried about potential loss of VOCs from reduced pressure over the milk, and that would produce off-gassing, and also contamination of the milk from pump plastics. Next. But this is an example of the unexpected. So what we found was that one of the chemicals we were interested in, in this case it was xylene, was also found in the rubber stoppers of the collection tubes, or the vacutainers, those little glass tubes that you use when you're um, uh, providing blood at a, at a doctor's visit. And the graphic you're looking at here shows levels of xylene from water in untreated vacutainers. Those are the yellow and red symbols at the top, compared to those that were pretreated to remove xylene. And those are the various colors of blue near the bottom. And so what this shows here is that our breast milk samples would have been contaminated with xylene had we not pretreated the stoppers. And the take home here is a warning that when using biomonitoring to assess exposure, we have to ensure that our samples haven't been contaminated. It has to, we have to ensure this during sample collection and shipping and storage and analysis. Next. Now, to, to systematically assess the quality of biomonitoring data, the instrument from that workshop that I mentioned a few slides ago can be used. And the various factors I've been discussing, as well as other important quality-related factors, are included in this instrument. We named it the Biomonitoring Environmental Epi and Short-Lived Chemicals Instrument, and you can see the publication and co-authors here. Despite the name that we gave it, it actually is also applicable to exposure data from environmental media and also to persistent chemicals. Next. The actual instrument shown here, it can be used to design, implement, and interpret studies, and I've given some purposes on this slide that I won't read. But as you can see from the graphic, down the left-hand column are many of the factors that we've been talking about. And you'll also notice that rather than having a numerical scoring system, we have a tiering system, and it produces what is essentially a heat map with green showing areas of highest quality of the study. And if you want more information on how to use the instrument, I'd either refer you to the publication that you saw on the previous slide, or you can always feel free to contact uh, me directly. Next. So up until this point in the webinar, I've been providing you with generic concepts that are applicable to researching exposures to cleaning products and respiratory health outcomes. But what I want to do now is move on to the last part of the webinar and talk about a specific example of risks and benefits that are associated with an activity that I, I think it's fair to call it a cleaning activity. And this example is on health benefits and potential respiratory risks associated with disinfection of swimming pool water, as well as respiratory health benefits from swimming itself. And I, I think this example will give you an idea of the complexities associated with an actual example of exposure and risk and benefit. So next. So why do we disinfect pool water? We disinfect because people are in pools. And when people go into pools, they introduce and leave behind all kinds of things, and many of these are shown on this slide, saliva, hair, mucus, feces, and so on. And according to Charles Gerba, the average swimmer contributes about a tenth of a gram of fecal matter and about 50 mils of urine when they go into a pool. Now, if we just focus on the pathogen contribution for a minute, we need to have a way to reduce risks associated with pathogens that are in pool water, because if we don't, people are going to get sick. Next slide. How big a problem are pathogens in recreational water? This is a slide from Dr. Michael Beach of the CDC, and this is showing recreational water illness outbreaks in the U.S. from 1978 to 2008. And these data are for gastroenteritis, and that's acute diarrhea and vomiting. And we can see here the number of outbreaks from year to year, with the total being 335. Next slide. So swimming pool is, in fact, a crucial component of public health and safety. In the past two decades, there's been an increase in the number of recreational water illness outbreaks associated with swimming. Cryptosporidium, or crypto, can stay alive for days, even in a well-maintained pool. And it's become the leading cause of swimming pool-related outbreaks of diarrheal illness. And crypto cases have been increasing. Next. So the benefit of disinfecting swimming pools is improvement in public health and safety due to reduced number of swimming outbreaks of various illnesses. But Disinfection, while well, inactivating pathogens, also results in the formation of disinfection byproducts, or DVPs. This is due to the reaction of the chlorine 
with substances in the pool water, such as urine. And I, I'm showing you two classes of DBPs here, trihalomethanes and chloro, uh, chloramines, but there have been hundreds of swimming pool-related DBPs that have been identified. Next. Now, since this webinar is focused on exposure, let's talk about what we need to know in order to characterize DBP exposures in swimming pool environments. First of all, we certainly need concentration data in water and air. Now, we have some measurements, but not that many. And the ones that we do have include only a very small number of the DBPs that we know are in the water. Now, swimming pool environments also, especially the ones that are indoors, can have other asthmogenic substances, including molds. And to my knowledge, at least, there have been no assessments of these types of stressors that we can use in our exposure assessment. What about other factors that we need information on? Well, you know, we know we have oral exposures in pools because drink, people drink some amount of pool water while swimming. And in fact, there are data on this from the Exposure Factors Handbook, and I show these at the bottom of the slide. We also know people are exposed to DBPs from inhalation of aerosols and inhalation of volatilized DBPs, and of course, there's dermal exposure. So we're going to need good information on the factors associated with all of these exposure routes. Next. Now, if we're going to think about respiratory health risks associated with exposure to DBPs, we also have to consider whether time in the pool enhances respiratory health, because this is going to complicate the interpretation of any study result. And we know there are benefits associated with swimming. For example, pediatricians recommend swimming exercise for kids, especially asthmatic kids, because we know swimming is associated with lower asthmogenicity. And I give some reasons on the slide. And we also know that swim exercise has beneficial effects on asthma symptoms. And some of the benefits are shown here as well. So we're going to have to consider not only potential risks related to DVP exposure, but also benefits associated with swimming. Next. So circling back to DVPs and risks, why are we concerned about swimming pools and asthma in the first place? Well, research has shown increased rates of asthma among elite athletes, and that includes swimmers. And secondly, there were a number of studies that came out of Belgium that were led by a particular research group um, and led them to propose something they called the chlorine hypothesis, and that's shown here. And what it says is that long-term attendance at indoor chlorinated swimming pools for young kids has been a major factor in the rise of asthma since the late 20th century. Next. So what do we know about the overall evidence for association between DVPs, swimming, and asthma? We know from a systematic review that asthma is more common among elite swimmers than participants in other sports. But we also know that there's no consistent association between the prevalence of asthma and swimming pool use during childhood. And as I already mentioned, we know that asthmatics may benefit from swimming training, and also that swimming produces significantly less airway resistance than other types of exercise. So the story is getting pretty complicated already. Next. Now, since the time of those early studies that came out of Belgium, there's new epi research. And just to keep us on time, um, I'm simply going to say that the newer studies didn't find adverse effects on respiratory health in swimming children, and in fact found some benefits. Next. Now, while these newer studies didn't replicate the findings of the earlier studies from Belgium, the story on risks and benefits associated with swimming and exposure to DBPs and asthma probably isn't over. For one thing, there are issues of generalizability, which you've already heard about a couple of times in this last hour. So for example, are the studies conducted in one country with one set of exposures representative of exposures in other countries? Further, we've limited um, the numbers of exposure assessments from these studies. And we have little to no data on DBPs in air or water and how these might differ from country to country or actually even pool to pool. And we also have very limited information that uses biomonitoring. And this could actually be pretty helpful because it could yield aggregate and cumulative exposure information. So the message highlighted by this case study is that the risk-benefit assessments related to cleaning are really in their early stages. And they're going to require much more extensive study. Next. So to summarize, first of all, we have an array of tools that have been developed for exposure assessment. And we have new approaches and tools that are becoming available all the time. Now at the same time, it's hard to do the kinds of studies that we need to give us robust exposure data. Um, next. <laughs>
obtaining more and better data, it's a burden on researchers. It's going to require more funding, and it's going to require more participant cooperation. And we may not be able to get perfect studies funded. We can use many of the approaches and tools that I talked about today to ensure that our exposure data represent actual exposures and at relevant times. And the last. And it's certainly the case that we're going to need high quality exposure data in order to be able to assess causality in epi research and to support risk assessments for cleaning related activities and products. Unmuted. Thank you for your attention. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Judy, for that wonderful lecture. Um, we're going to now open um, up the, the webinar series or session for questions, and Dr. Andy Mayer is going to um, start asking you some questions. Well, thanks very much, Judy, and um, I really enjoyed the presentation. I'm not sure I'm going to enjoy the rest of my swimming summer, however. <laughs> yeah, I do that to people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we do have a number of questions, um, so I'm trying to pick and choose amongst them here. But let me just start with one that um, was raised, and one 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 comment or question was perhaps getting your respect, your perspective on kind of risk versus benefits, and in particular with regard to cleaning, the idea of the hygiene hypothesis. Yeah. So what I what I can say about that is that we have a number of what I'll call case studies where people have worked hard to try to understand trade-offs with risks and benefits. And it's, it's, a quite, it's quite a difficult exercise. So one example is um, we know that fish consumption is, is beneficial, but we also know that fish contain various environmental chemicals such as PCBs that um, at high enough concentrations can produce adverse health effects. And so there have been attempts to, to do a risk-benefit analysis to try to figure out which kinds of fish and just how much fish one could eat to get the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids while minimizing exposures to PCBs and the associated risks. Um, and there are obviously attempts here with similar uh, examinations of risk benefit for um, benefits of cleaning and reduction in, in uh, asthmogenic substances uh, in contrast with risks associated with chemical exposure. And I, I think we're, um, I have to say that I think we, we are only in the early stages of being able to do this well. And you mentioned the hygiene hypothesis, and I think even this hypothesis is that there's a lot of um, contrasting literature, and you'll find this if you do a search on this topic, that some studies seem to indicate that kids who are in what I'll loosely call less hygienic environments early in life um, they may have greater exposures to pets or farm animals, may have lower risk of asthma. But then there have been some follow-up studies that haven't um, replicated earlier findings. And so, again, I think we're in the early stages of understanding this. Okay, well, excellent. Yeah, and I had, that's a good thought. I haven't thought about the comparative um, risk assessment approaches, like for dietary intake. That's, that's a good. I really appreciate that. We have another question here. Another kind of hot topic of the day is, is you have someone asking your, your thoughts on how is, is techniques like reverse dosimetry going to be helpful for putting some of the biomonitoring data kind of approaches with regard to consumer and cleaning products into use for hazard data? Right. So uh, as I mentioned in, in that talk, um, I don't have that slide in front of me, but if you um, Traditionally in risk assessment, in the hazard ID component and then the dose response component, what we're ending up with is something like a reference dose that's going to be in units of milligram, kilogram day. And so in a, in a traditional risk assessment, we would estimate intake also in milligram, kilogram day. And then we would compare our intake to that reference dose. And if our intake is higher than that reference dose, then we think we have cause for concern. And if it's lower than the reference dose, we, we uh, feel more confident that um, we don't have to worry about that exposure. With biomonitoring, we're measuring a chemical in, say, um, milligram per liter of you know, urine. And that doesn't directly correspond to the reference dose that we are used to using in risk characterization. And so in dose reconstruction, what we try to do is take the level that we measure, either in urine or blood, and we try to use um, 
physiologically based models to back calculate what that person took in in units of milligram per kilogram day. And that would allow us to directly compare to, for example, a reference dose or a tolerable daily intake. And there's, there's a lot of work going on in, in order to be able to move back and forth between um, external, what I'll call external dose, the milligram, kilogram, day dose, and internal levels to try to get sort of a, a smooth transition um, across the exposure spectrum. Excellent. Thank you. And another question that was uh, provided is, we had heard in prior talks there's an issue related to the impact of dermal exposures on asthma responses and the question was asked is how to what degree have dermal exposure considerations been included in uh, what's been done related to cleaning product epidemiology so that's a really good question um, so in order to um, when I first started thinking about this webinar I spent uh, time in the literature and I have to say that, and as I mentioned this earlier in this hour, the literature here is pretty sparse, and um, I can take a, try to take another look and see if I can find something specific to answer this question. But I, I don't recall seeing a lot in the literature or much at all that would that would directly address that question. Okay, well, well, thanks so much, and I always hesitate to ask the next one that was uh, uh, sent in to us. Are you aware of any? Um, studies that have specifically tried to apply, you know, kind of a formal cumulative risk assessment thinking, integrating chemical, biological, and, and other stressors in, in an assessment? I'm not. I, I, I can't swear to you it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen it. And Judy, my own, my own question on top of that one, has that been done to some degree in other uh, risk assessments? You know, is there a model for doing it? There's, there's certainly models for, um, for looking at multiple chemical exposures and health outcomes. And there is a lot of interest in the exposome and in thinking about trying to get um, uh, broader types of exposures included. So not just chemical stressors, but biological stressors, um, uh, societal pressures and stressors that, that could come into play and, and be related to stress-related stress, stress related outcomes. So the idea of the exposome and non-targeted exposures are gaining, um, gaining a lot of interest. They're, I think, in their early stages, but I expect that we'll see more of this kind of approach as we move forward. Because the chemical-by-chemical chemical approach has not really been particularly satisfactory. Great. I think we just have time for a couple more questions, so I'm just kind of screening through to, to select here. Um, this one seems very interesting. I hadn't thought of this before. So the question relates to, we think about interactions from sort of the toxicology side and sort of a routinely, not necessarily doing a lot about it, but thinking about it. So the question is, are there interactions, quote unquote, you know, dealt with in the exposure assessment side for a situation like this? So I'm not completely sure I understand the question, except that to say that I assume what you're talking about is that you know, on the talk side you have synergistic effects or antagonistic effects. Um, on the exposure side, I think the closest thing that comes to mind is that we have chemicals that we know um, behave similarly enough that we tend to group them together when we assess exposure. So dioxins would be an example where we, where we take the, the 17 dioxin congeners and we tend to think about exposure to those 17 chemicals in terms of a, a toxic equivalency or a TEQ. Is that um, perhaps what the, uh, what the question is related to? I'm not sure, but um, another way to, another, I guess, interpretation might be are there interactions in terms of one chemical, them, Exposure to one chemical affecting the amount of exposure to another. Well, there are there are different um, there are different types of exposures that can impact, for example, um, and, and different. When I say exposure, now I'm using it as a very broad term. 
that can impact, for example, the amount of a chemical that may be absorbed across the gastrointestinal tract. So that, that, certainly, um, that certainly is an issue that needs to be considered. And in the exposure community, there's a lot of discussion now. In traditional exposure assessment, we would stop at the boundary. We would think about what got across the skin or into the mouth or into the lungs, and we would um, that's where exposure science sort of ended and toxicological sciences would take over. But I, I think that there is, a, there is a move toward thinking about exposure assessment further into, that it goes further into the body. And so issues like chemicals affecting each other or other aspects of um, our environment affecting things like absorption will, um, are, are being thought of as part of exposure, not just toxicology. Okay, great. And we're, we're actually out of time, but I'll add one, one more and then we'll, we'll close here. Because um, someone asked about um, noting that you emphasized a little bit on direct reading instruments and the relationship between that as a tool to help us understand peak versus uh, integrated exposures because understanding the toxicology, um, there's roles between both of those might be causal in, in asthma. I'm sorry, and the question? Yes, I, th I think the, the question was, how, how useful are direct reading instruments going to help us in understanding peak versus area under the curve types of exposures, since both of those might be important for asthma? You know, there is, there is along with other um, sort of new aspects of exposure science, there's a lot of focus on the development of inexpensive sensors. And so I think this issue uh, and, the, and the approach of using direct measurements, um, it may increase and may become uh, more useful as we move forward. Um, and it's something that I think is really exciting because as you saw from the, the diagram from the paper earlier in this, in this um, presentation, it would be really easy to mischaracterize exposures. In that example, it was from cleaning products if you didn't have that um, exposure profile, exposure time profile. So uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by advances in sensor technology, and I, I'm hoping that we'll get a lot more use from that and a lot more data from that approach. Okay, well, well, thanks very much, Judy. And, and for folks, we didn't get to your questions. Uh, Judy can be able to respond to those offline and provide them back to you. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Melissa Vincent. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your attention. Uh, the slides and audio from this presentation will be made uh, available online at a later date. We will send a follow-up email um, to all registrants uh, with the link and the information on how to access that, the slides and the recording. Our next presentation will be August 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our, pres our presenter is Dr. Scott Dotson from NIOSH. Uh, he will be discussing, again, as I said earlier, um, setting exposure limits for chemical allergens and understanding the challenges of doing so with the understanding that allergy plays a role in asthma. Uh, for those who are participating for continuing education credit, uh, you will be mailed a survey upon um, completion of this webinar. Please complete the survey mailed back to you. Um, CE credits are available only to those people who've completed five surveys, so one survey for each of the webinars. Again, thank you very much for everyone or to everyone for uh, for joining us for this presentation, and we hope you, that you continue to join us for our future webinars. Thank you.